Uh, let's see. Next, we have uh, Frederick Ferner uh, from Diamond Light Source. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, how they use luster uh, in their environment. Well, I, I, guess, friends. I guess um, I can start um, giving a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, Diamond Light Source is um, a large synchrotron uh, research facility. We operate uh, a synchrotron in, in the UK. We just operate the synchrotron uh, and the experimental stations, uh, which we call beam lines. And um, we provide the de detectors and the facility and external scientists um, come and do their research. Uh, they bring their samples. They do the research in our facility. They do the processing of their, their data. Um, and then they take the results home. Some, some people take the data home, but uh, most people take the, the results. Um, and on our slides. Um, I'm going to talk about what is diamond light source, um, a bit of background about what light, or what, what is the light that we're actually using there. Um, what does our network look like? What the data flow looks like? The file systems, luster file systems that we have, um, and then a bit of our about our upgrades and uh, typical detectors um, that we have that write the data to luster. A um, bit of our monitoring and, and short wish list of what we would like to see. Um, as I said, Diamond Light Source is the na uh, UK's national synchrotron facility. It is um, located at the Harvard Science and Innovation Campus. Um, it's this south of Oxford, uh, in Oxfordshire in the UK. It's a third generation light source, which basically means that it um, uses um, insertion devices as well as bending magnets, if, you, if you're familiar with um, the way um, synchrotrons work. We've got a storage ring that's about 561 or 562 meters in circumference. Um, the energy of the electrons in there is 3 GeV, and we are aiming to have a current of uh, about 300 milliamps. It's the largest uh, investment in, in science that the UK had made in the last 45 years, um, so we're quite quite pleased with that. Um, we've had the first users in 2007, um, and I would say we are still we're still fairly new. We have increased the number of beam lines um, since 2007 continuously. We started in 2007 with, by the end of 2007, we had uh, six beam lines. At the moment, we have about 20 beam lines in operation, and we have 30 beam lines planned, and in theoretical space for about 40. Um, I promised a quick overview of what, what sort of light we're using. Um, if you look at the s light spectrum, um, and you can see, no, no. Anyway, you can see the the uh, yellow bar there. That that's uh, the light spectrum that we actually use. So you can see it is uh, all the way from infrared to X-rays. And depending on which experimental station your your detector is on, you will you will use a different light. And uh, depending on what light you're using. Um, you can do different types of science. Um, so at Diamond, you can you, you, we provide facilities for a wide range of, uh, of scientific um, fields, starting with uh, archaeology, where they have looked, for example, at uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, um, did tomography on them, uh, managed to read them without actually unrolling them and without exposing them to the, to the um, environment, which made me quite happy. We have bioscience research, climate change research, nanotechnology, green technologies. I mean, that we usually have um, new, new research on, on uh, photovoltaics and things like that. We've got one beam line um, dedicated to extreme conditions where they do research at uh, high temperatures, many thousands of kelvins, high pressures, 300 uh, or two to 300 uh, up bar. Um, medical science is, is quite common, and um, also material science. Um, 
period signs, surface signs, all sorts of things. And with that wide range um, of applications comes a wide range of detectors, and the detectors have a wide, wide range of, of requirements from our side. Uh, so first let me give you a very brief overview over the network. We decided to uh, run a re redundant network. We've got two core networks, and all the experimental stations, all the detectors, all the uh, um, compute clusters, they're, they're all basically um, individual racks, individual switches, individual uh, slash 24 networks that are dual connected to both um, core networks, depending on requirements, either with one gigabit ethernet or 10 gigabit ethernet uplinks, or in the uh, case of some of our clusters, two times 10 gig uplinks. Um, they all, all the, all the um, subnets are symmetrically connected to both networks. Uh, that way, if we lose one network, we can still operate. We have we done, uh, reduced performance, obviously, but we can still operate. The data that is generated is, you can see it on the top left, is generated on the beam lines, is written to our uh, central file systems. Then from there, it is read on the compute clusters to be processed, and some data is written back. It is also written, uh, it's also read on visualization work workstations, especially on the tomography beam lines, they make a heavy use of that. And we also continuously, uh, as the users take their data, ship it out to them, usually in form of uh, hard drives that they attach to, to dedicated machines on the beam lines when they arrive. Um, we've got, as I said, we've got two Luster file systems. Luster 01 is our old file system, is about 300 terabyte usable. By now, when I wrote the slide, it was 60% full. It's a bit, um, it's now closer to 70%. It's one DDA, DDN uh, SBA9900 for the OCs, and uh, it used to be MD3000 for MDT. We've got Dell PowerEdge 2970s for OSSs and MDSs, six OSSs in active, fail uh, active, F active pairs, um, one MDS pair, active passive as usual. Uh, all the servers are connected directly to the 10 gigabit, uh, to the core networks via 10 gig gigabit ethernet. Each server is only connected to one, one network, so if, if we have a network failure, we have to do a failover. Uh, and the write speed that we saw from that was about 3.5 gigabyte. Um, and last year we um, commissioned a new file system which is about 400 terabyte, uh, DDN SFA 10K for OSTs and the year 3015 for the MDT. New Adel servers for OSSs and MDS, four OSSs this time, uh, but to uh, keep up with the bandwidth, these OSSs are uh, dual attached, have uh, LACP bonded gigabit in interfaces, 10 gig EP. Um, MDS pair as usual, and the throughput that we've seen from that is about 5.5 gigabytes. Um, as I said, the first cluster file system we had, Dell MD3000 MD as, as an MDT, and we were really disappointed with the metadata performance of that, um, and our users complained heavily about that. We couldn't really pinpoint it. We couldn't find the reason for that. We, we've looked long and hard and we couldn't, couldn't find, it, find any reason it, that we didn't see any, any uh, I.O. weights or the CPU wasn't busy, network wasn't saturated, but with experience from the second file system, we decided to upgrade the MDT to, to high performance um, backend and at the same time replace the servers. We transferred the um, whole method MDT with just DD over the network uh, run a quick file system check on, on the MDT while it was offline, didn't find any errors, brought the file system up, and everything started working. And then we did a comparison, um, looked at the MD test rates compared to the old file system. You can see in red the old file system down at the bottom, which didn't make us happy, but we are quite happy with the improvement. Um, quite a few factors in there. So um, that has happened last month it remains to be seen if the, the users actually notice the difference. We, we definitely hope so, but uh, you never know. Um, as I said, we're using it as a data acquisition file system. 
So all the all the large high throughput that detectors directly write write to Lustre. Um, we think that that's working for us, but it, it provides some challenges that I wouldn't expect from a standard HPC um, environment. One problem is first problem: our clients are distributed across the whole building, um, which, as far as I can see, rules out Infiniband. Um, so we are stuck with Ethernet. Um, the applications, the types of detectors are very, very different. Some, um, as I said, have uh, large files or relatively large files. Files. Other detectors write at the moment still about 400k files, um, and usually quite a few of them. Um, any interruption on the file system can, as I say, cause data loss, which it basically means that if, for example, the uh, crystallographers put their sample in the X-ray and uh, to take the data, the X-ray actually destroys the the crystal. And if it's if it has been there, if that was their only good crystal of that type, and the file system decides to have a brief, big brief pause while they're collecting the data and they can't write the data, they will be very unhappy. Um, and we don't want that. Um, and users, as their users, are very impatient. We have interactive use of our file system. Users wait for their data. I have seen I have seen watch LS minus LTR quite a few times, uh, which, as you can all imagine, kills metadata performance. Um, but you can tell users as much as you like, and they will not listen, especially in our environment, as I have not mentioned, but we have external scientists, so they come once or twice, and you can't really reach them. Um, we have a re requirement for strict access control, because at two different times at the same beam line, there might be two competing uh, research groups. We have industrial users sometimes, so we definitely have to make sure that they can't see the other group's data. So we make heavy use of ACLs. Um, had some problems with that because ACLs on Lustre are limited to 32 ACLs. And we sometimes would like to have more. And last but not least, we have quite a few applications that are Windows based. Um, so we need access to the data from Windows. Um, and that is not always easy. Um, one typical um, detector is, is the Pilatus detector, uh, manufactured by a company called Sexis in Switzerland. Um, they, they, they come in different types, but the most common type um, that we have at the moment at Diamond writes six megabyte files at, depending on what, they, what the users want, up to 25 hertz. Um, which is which is fairly easy for our file system, um, but it can they they can take long scans with uh, ten thousand and more images um, taken, and if the file system stops in between, they're again they're they're a bit unhappy. Uh, the data from especially these detectors is immediately processed on on the computer. So different types of jobs are um, running immediately after the, the data has been taken, which is um, very obviously it's giving nice peaks in, in read performance, especially as the data is cached, but it also uh, saturate can saturate the network for a long time. Um, the similar type of, of detector, Pilatus detector, that we will be um, receiving shortly uh, is an upgrade and will operate still writing six megabyte files, but operate at, at about 100 hertz. So we, c we have to keep upgrading our file system. Different application, tomography. Um, they usually write slightly bigger, fr bigger frames. And it takes about half an hour to, to, to run a typical tomography scan. They will take a sample and run um, slices. At the moment, the detector is running at about three to five hertz. It's a Windows-based camera, so we have to write the data from Windows, which is, is proving interesting, to say the least. Um, at the moment, they're writing individual TIFF files at 5 hertz, which 
sort of works. We had to put 10 gig Ethernet on the Windows machine to actually uh, get to the 70 megabyte second that we want. Uh, gigabit Ethernet wasn't working. That seems to be a Windows uh, limitation. Um, the data from these detectors is, is um, processed directly on the GPU cluster um, where they just do the uh, reconstruction and if you're familiar with tomography they just write the same data in a slightly different format again. They have just told me that they have a new detector uh, generation coming that will operate at 70 hertz writing from multiple Windows machines. Um, Initially, they were suggesting to still write TIFF files, but uh, we decided that we told them that was a very bad idea, and we've got some in-house development uh, to to write that directly from Windows into HDF5 files without involving um, Samba, and we hope that using that we can we can actually improve the uh, throughput. Um, that's that. We're doing a bit of monitoring usually health, health checks using Nagios. We're recently implementing um, Senos, uh, which, which does all the health checks that Nagios does, but it also integrates some performance monitoring. It usually gets its data via SMMC. We have um, Ganglia, we use Selectl, but with Selectl we have the problem that the, the data is usually on the local machine, and if we need to look at it, we need to get it. So that is not quite satisfactory. We've started look to look at LMT, and uh, we've managed to get some data out to, to demonstrate to the users or to the scientists that our file system is not the bottleneck. Uh, but if they need want to buy bigger detectors, faster detectors, we need a faster file system. And never to forget, when you're talking about monitoring, your users can be f amazingly fast, much faster than our Nagios sometimes. They call us if they find a problem before, before anything else is noticed. Um, and that just brings me to m the last slide, um, a brief wish list. We would like to have better performance from Windows. Mostly it reads from users' workstations, but also as we have detectors based on Windows, we would like to have um, good write performance. Increasing the number of ACLs per file and directory would be something that we would um, si like to see. 32 is, in our environment, sometimes a bit low. Um, Talking about ACLs, we have been thinking about moving uh, because we have so such a we have quite a lot of stuff on Windows file systems. We have been thinking about NFS v4 ACLs because they they are matched closer to Windows ACLs. Um, monitoring, as I said, Senos gets everything via SNMP if it can. So providing performance data and, and other things via SNMP from the cluster servers might be something that we um, would like. But I'm not just demanding here. Um, I don't just want to demand things. Um, so if there is something out there that where we can help as a fairly small site, but still uh, we would like to help. So if there's anything, let us know and we will think about it. Thank you.